So are there any questions from members of the audience about the presentations that they've seen? Uh, Jenny O'Sullivan, wonderful session, enjoyed all of them. Uh, just Rick, very terrific to be supporting the Australian uh, product. Just interested if you're looking at doing a similar thing with wool and, and what your perception of sustainability for some of the other industries with, with what's been achieved with cotton, what the impact might be down the track for wool. Yeah, so we probably haven't looked at wool uh, very closely yet. We don't use, um, uh, sell as many wool-based items as we do Australian cotton, but um, we have thought about this though. I mean, the, the, the trend and the desire of our customers to buy, support more Australian grown items would you know, cross over, no doubt, to wool. So there's, there's no reason, the research we've seen, um, why they're wanting to support this wouldn't, wouldn't be successful wool either. It's just probably not an item we, we, we use as much of at the moment. Um, so, what was the second part of your question? Sorry, I... Oh, is it other sustainability issues, so if you're going... Yeah, to... yeah, absolutely. And I'd, I'd have to learn about the Australian wool industry just as I've learned about the uh, Australian cotton industry the last 12 months. So, uh, yeah, that'd be one we'd have to research as well, I think. Thank you. There's, there's another question here at, at the front. Thank you. Um, Harvey Gaynor from Oscott Limited. Um, question to, um, to Angus and John. Um, as a cotton grower, I felt a little bit around by your presentation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was curious as to whether um, you know, there's any, um, anything to suggest that uh, you know, cotton, as opposed to synthetics or other forms of the wall, is um, just sort of uh, an irritant for eczema or other conditions, or it's just um, that. So it, it goes to the rationale of why wool it, uh, is, was found to be beneficial for eczema sufferers. And, and wool uh, it has an ability to absorb and release uh, moisture, moisture vapour, far more than uh, almost all other fibre types. Um, so, so that it has a buffering capacity so that it, it maintains a more stable um, microclimate between the garment and the skin. Uh, so a more stable temperature and more stable humidity and keeps it even over the, over the, the normal fluctuations that exist in, in life. Cotton also has an ability to absorb and release moisture. Uh, and to put it in perspective, uh, wool can absorb up to about 36% of its weight in moisture vapour. Cotton can absorb about 20% or 18% or of its weight in moisture vapour. Polyester, by contrast, can absorb about 3%. So uh, in terms of uh, having that buffering effect, you know, it, it would probably follow that same scale that, that uh, wool is the best, cotton is intermediate, and synthetics are you know, right down the bottom. So I guess as, uh, when we embarked on this journey, we looked at this issue specifically. And um, I have talked to one of your colleagues in Alan Williams uh, about this too. One of the areas we have yet to explore potentially is the benefits of strategic combination of the two. Ultimately, our fibre, particularly at the seven and a half micron level, is about seven or eight times the cost of, of the, the, the cotton, cotton equivalent. And so all of these, in effect, commercial product discussions will need to be conducted in terms of price points to, to meet market demands. And it's going to be a balance between price and efficacy essentially. So this is not meant to be us um, denigrating cotton, essentially, although that is an advantage, I guess, from, from the wool industry perspective <laughs> in a competent, competition sense. But I actually think there's a really, it's more a story about natural fibres and it's about hygroscopic fibres. Um, and there's, it's, perhaps there's other dimensions we'll explore as well uh, that relate also to sustainability. Where does, your oil, where does your carbon come from? At least we know our carbon comes from the atmosphere. It's not mined carbon. And that's, this relates, as a direct producer I have, uh, Rick, how much effort or intensity do you look at landfill in your sustainability uh, considerations? Oh, that's a tough technical question. <laughs> I have uh, our um, carbon emissions reporting and so forth actually handed by another manager in our team. Um, but look, the, it is part of the calculations, but building energy is the main, 
may go. See, that's an interesting one for us because we both are biodegradable fibres, whereas so much of what is worn on the back of consumers is not biodegradable. Anyway, are there any, any other questions that people, people have? Sorry, there's one at the back. Hi, um, my name is Jake I'm both from ABS. Um, I'm just wondering, um, it's a question for the AWI guys, um, just in relation to when you look at things like um, pad to plate, whether wool's actually looking at being able to identify where um, the source of the wool's coming from. So you can actually say it's come from a particular farm or a particular region. I know there are large companies in New Zealand where they can trace the back to um, the farm gate using a barcode, by AA, or AAA. Um, and um, I, I think um, from a marketing point of view um, and even a biosecurity point of view, it would really be good to be able to have that sort of traceability. Have you guys looked into that at all? Okay. Look, uh, yes, uh, the short answer is yes. We've actually looked at uh, traceability and supply chain management for a long time. Um, the, there are two issues that I guess confound things. And it, um, uh, what is the scale of commercial consignments? Uh, most commercial consignments that go through the top making processes are about 60 tonnes, or 50 tonnes. Sorry, that was the timer for Rick. That's not my phone. Sounded like a phone. Phone? Okay. <laughs> and the, if I can say there's there's no third there's no third verse to the national anthem. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, we've looked pretty hard at that issue, and um, so there's a scale issue because most commercial consignments are made up wool from many farms, but. Um, uh, there is increasing interest, and it, it just speaks to exactly what Rick spoke about in terms of the, the desire of consumers to look behind a label and understand where it's come from, or to be able to access the consumer story through their, their, their digital device. Um, yes, the Kiwis have, for example, they, you, can, um, you can look at a little barcode on the inside of your base layer and scan it and it'll tell you which farmers contributed, which is a fantastic opportunity. Ultimately, someone has to pay for it and that therein lies the challenge. It's more a practical delivery mechanism. It can easily be done. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, Alice Hawks from the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, uh, I suppose this is a, a question for all the panel and uh, maybe the uh, AWI guys have considered this. But is there uh, some research to show? Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that polyester can absorb two percent of its weight, uh, cotton eighteen, wool thirty six. Um, now, is there any um, research that's related that to the actual change in temperature? So, being able to say that okay, this garment will reduce hot days by 4 degrees or something of the like? I'm not sure. So reducing hot days either for the wearer or the general climate? Yeah, so comfort. Comfort. Okay, I guess you want to talk to that one? Sure. So, so there's, there's two components. When you're talking about uh, thermal, maintaining you know, homeostasis, the, the thermal status of the, of the body, there's two components. There's the thermal insulation that is offered by the, the garment uh, and, and wool contributes to that mostly because the fibres are crimped and they trap more air within, within the fabric structure. And the more air that you've got in there, the more insulation you have. But probably the bigger uh, impact is, is the breathability and the, the uh, ability of, of uh, hygroscopic fibres which can move moisture vapour from one side to the other is the bigger factor because if on a hot day your body wants to sweat uh, to cool down and for that to sweat to evaporate and wool rather than capture and, and hold that, 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 that sweat within the garment and give you that hot and clammy sensation it's able to breathe and, and, move the, and rapidly move the moisture vapour to the outside where it does sweat and have the desired cooling effect. It's an active area of research and back in the 1980s and 90s CSRO when I was going through we were actively developing the basis of what became sports wool which was using the wool as an inner with a synthetic outer because the synthetic products just couldn't handle sweat. You'd end up saturated. 
it's still an active area of, of interest. Uh, we work closely with Adidas and Nike and other, and other companies, and it's a great little irony that this one of the most old uh, fibre industries and one of the oldest fibres is some of its basic properties, its basic chemical properties are still very relevant. The key is for these markets, they are so technically demanding in terms of product quality and, and so on. So that is the challenge for the industry. No different to cotton. Any other questions? Yes. Julia Sullivan, I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on the other health benefits. You had a list there, and I was particularly interested in the sleep one. Um, and just interested in some of the other health benefits that you've researched uh, before. Okay, so the sleep one uh, is uh, perhaps not as progressed as, as the skin health area. Uh, it's, it, there has been a lot of studies on, on wool's beneficial effect for sleep, uh, you know, going right back into the 1900s. Um, and the wool, uh, when you get into a wool bed, uh, and into a bed with a wool blanket in the, uh, in the early research looked at this, um, the body's emitting uh, um, a moisture, you know, insensible uh, um, uh, emissions. And uh, those emissions are taken up by the wool and it actually generates heat. Uh, and so if you put it in the form of a duvet, a typical duvet, when you get into, into, into bed and emit what is about the sort of typical level of emissions of the human will do, the, the amount of heat generated by the duvet is about the same as having another person behind, beside you. Not all of that is coming down, some of it's going out to the, to the bedroom. But, but that, um, that warming sensation uh, has an effect on, on giving you earlier sleep onset. So you fall asleep faster. And then uh, when you go into deeper sleep, um, the body is less able to uh, maintain its own uh, temperature and, and, and the homeostasis uh, isn't, isn't as strong, particularly in stage three state sleep. So if you're well insulated, if you have layers on you that are keeping you in about the right zone, uh, then you're more likely to stay in deeper sleep. But if, if, the, if, if, the, uh, if it's not, then you can wake up and move into a lighter stage of sleep. So that's the sort of rationale for why there's a, a sleep benefit. And John mentioned um, in, his, um, in his presentation that children and, and adult, adults with eczema who scratch themselves while they're asleep can, can wake up uh, and, uh, and they have very disturbed sleep and that's part of their their symptoms. Um, so wool may be contributing to both sides of them, you know, keeping their skin better hydrated, but also um, if you're sleeping it, uh, um, giving you a better night's sleep. So there's the initial work, there's, uh, they've looked at sleeping on wool in terms of underlays, and there's published papers in things like The Lancet looking at use of wool sheepskins for neonates in paediatric units, for example. Mm. There's there's stud studies looking at sleeping in wool and sleeping under wool. Okay, so there's three sort of target markets. Present moment, we're doing some work, we call it was the Boomers study. So it's basically looking at present company excluded, of course, people entering menopausal age, because we, we tend to run hot and cold more readily than uh, other age groups. Um, there are other indirect benefits too, in terms of, uh, flame retardance, flame resistance, which is a very important thing in the sleep market. Um, other fibres um, burn particularly well or sustain a flame. In oxygen, wool doesn't sustain a flame in normal atmospheric pressures. So there are a number of areas to explore. The key thing I'd say is that to do this work, and particularly to generate contemporary science data, like the clinical work John presented, and I spoke, I first met you in 1991 at the Australian College of Dermatology Conference in Hobart, I think it was. It takes a long time to get through this process, to get the ethics approvals and to generate the science. And so that's one of the challenges that faces not only us, but the cotton industry, for example, if they were to go down this path. Any other questions? We have a couple more minutes to go. Yes, there's a, a gentleman here. Craig Kroger from Bravo Bank. Can I just have a question for Rick, just in regards to the purchase of Australian cotton? Rick, uh, do you deal directly with the Australian 
cotton jeans as far as product or, or do you more push it back through your suppliers saying we now want you to supply with Australian cotton and please show us the traceability and you just explain why you go one way or the other? Yeah, so that's the second um, part you mentioned there. So essentially, um, our, we would put out an order to our su suppliers in, in Asia predominantly, and then they, you know, we take our policy if you only want Australian cotton or some other form, and then they then obviously purchase it down the line through the fabric mill who purchases it from the gin, the ex cotton exporter back in Australia. Now, that's not to say we can't talk to the cotton exporters here and the farms. Uh, we can, and I, I have picked up the phone and had a couple of conversations where we've been trying to trace back and do some checks right through the chain. So it, there could be a relationship there, but the way we typically work is through our large suppliers in Asia, and then we just make it very clear what our policy is, and then we, we follow them to make sure they can follow through. Thank you. Um, if, if I can ask a question of John. Uh, John, how, the results and the studies that you're involved in, how big a journey do you think it will be to have some sort of international consensus or recognition in the dermatological community? Um, <coughs> I've actually presented the results already at two conferences. One was the Atopic Dermatitis International Symposium, and the other one was the European Society meeting, and it was very well received. I, I think it, it was a, um, we, I think we did all the right things in terms of, for example, blinding, uh, randomizing, um, doing it in a controlled way. And we did look at a number of variables. We even measured um, environmental conditions on a daily basis to try to standardize for that. So there is a lot of further work that needs to be done for understanding. But I, I think it's, in terms of its, its, um, its size, it's not a, it's not the biggest study. I mean, it's a, it's a small study, so I think numbers will definitely in, increase the the impact. And I think the the involvement of different sites around the world to study different environments is going to be very useful for generalizability. But I think certainly for our region, um, it speaks well. And I I haven't had any kind of um, questioning or disputes amongst my my colleagues in that sense. Fantastic. Mm. Thank you. Any, any other questions in the audience? Rick, if I could ask, um, would you have advice or recommendations for the Australian cotton industry in terms of internationalising your experience? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the main one is the, the move towards um, standards like the Better Cotton Initiative, as, as I mentioned. So. We've, the research we've done the last 12 months, we've, we, you know, we talked to H&M, we talked to our peers in Europe. Um, as I said, the move is really on to, to move, transition to sustainably certified cotton. Um, and again, because of the work Australian Cotton's done, the MyBNP standard, they've essentially got the jump on the global market on that front. And so promoting the sustainability credentials of Australian Cotton is the right thing to do. Um, but if you are a farm and you have not yet made the full leap through to certification, you need to do it. Um, yes, there's a bit of an investment, um, but I think you'll get the return in the long term. And then in the short to medium term, again, if you're not certified within a couple of years, you might find yourself getting locked out of some of those big orders from the gins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Carolyn, you've escaped Goodness, all of the questions here. so far. <laughs> So the, one of the things that uh, we often talk about black swan events in uh, economics, which I think as a swan myself, it's a really pejorative description. I know. We, we have, I'm w wondering what major risks you considered in your forecast, because the forecast looked very, very bullish. Uh, for example, there's a man with orange, orange skin and white hair in the White House, and there's lots of talk about the uh, trade wars and those sorts of things. Do you see any, is it a risky outlook for you? There are risks from the outlook for some of the factors you've just mentioned, and they are usually identified first when we do our analysis in the macroeconomic overview. Because of course, if there were something that happened with international trade due to our friend in the White House, if that caused there to be a weakening in economic growth in the United States, and therefore, 
uh, lower consumer confidence and a regression um, in terms of people's consumption of uh, items such as higher value clothing, then that will feed all the way back through the supply chain. At this point, there are no indications. I mean, we, we do forecast based on the information we have, and we don't know the unknown, obviously. But we identify those areas as downside risks to the vision. Certainly on the supply side, things are setting up well, but we could go into a drought in a couple of years and our supply might fall. You just never know what's going to happen. But the, what, what we're seeing now in terms of where consumers are, are taking uh, their choices for cotton and for wool is very favorable for Australia, but all it takes is an external shock caused by whether uh, increased tariffs for Chinese exports to the US, uh, even promotional efforts in the United States of, you know, buy American, don't buy anything from China or anyone else, you just, you just never know. And we might be having a completely different conversation next year. It happens, you know, no one could have predicted the global financial crisis, maybe a couple of people did, but I, I mean, I was here in 2009, 10 and answering a question, you know, Caroline, last year you said this and now you're saying the exact opposite. You know, what, what didn't you know? And like, well, I didn't know what millions of people didn't know and that was the GFC. Yeah. So there could always be a shock, um, but for right now, as things are, things are looking good. and. Um, we'll just watch this space. And my understanding is that the outlook for the economic cycle in the states and in the OECD world is actually on the, the positive, is that correct? It is. I mean, we've been talking about the positive upswing in growth in OECD countries for a couple of years. Um, here at Outlook in the macroeconomic overview, it's always been there. But the growth uh, percentages that we are putting forth, they didn't eventuate, and that wasn't just sort of our failure. It's just that's the way the world went. And that's why we didn't see the strengthening in demand that we'd been expecting. Um, and that's why I touched on it in my presentation. That, I mean, that could have had far more detrimental impact on demand for our raw fiber, stemming from weaker demand for Chinese exports. But because of the growth in China, all of that kept moving forward. And it was still a, a positive uh, environment for our industry. Um, yeah, th leave it at that, I think. OK. Look, are there any final questions from the audience? If not, I'd like you to put your hands together for our speakers. And, um,